Welcome, 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 everybody. My name is Brian, and this is another one of my painting tutorials. Today, we are painting the amazing Jolton Joe DiMaggio. That's correct. Oh, a little bit about Joe's career, huh? He was 325 lifetime batting average, 2,214 hits, 13 time All Star player, three time MVP, nine times World Series champion. I misspelled champion, look at that. World War II vet, yes, and he married Marilyn Monroe. He was Mr. Coffee's spokesman, and according to a Seinfeld episode, he was a regular at Dinky's Donuts, where he dunked his donuts uh, without distraction. That's right, laser-like focus, which is uh, not what I have when I paint, that's for sure. I usually listen to music or check the internet. i got to get away from the darn computer when I'm painting, uh, but um, sometimes I get locked in, and I think I was pretty locked in on this one. I enjoyed painting this. And uh, let's get right into it. There's my canvas. What What's this green for? I don't see any trees. Looks like I'm painting the sky a greenish blue. And uh, why am I doing that? The reason is, is because I think I see that color in the sky in the photo. And uh, as one of my teachers, Mr. Bartman said, if you think you see a color, you do. And uh, if you're wrong, this is my... Mm, my paraphrasing it. If you're wrong, well, at least you've made your painting colorful and it's not boring and mundane. So in this case, I'm going for color in the sky. I could just lay out blue. Nobody would question it. I could just use different shades of blue. But if I think I see some green, maybe the camera's filter that day was picking up green, uh, I'm putting it in. If I think I see some strawberry gray in the sky, then I'm going to put that in there. And, um, I'm working the sky pretty thick early on because to me that's going to be the final layer really. Um, I've already toned the canvas in a burnt umber. I let that dry. Then I drew Joe DiMaggio and uh, then I got out a Sharpie. I went over my drawing. I went over the pencil marks and then I got a big eraser out and erased the evidence of drawing so that I'm only left with the Sharpie drawing. This is a technique that I've started doing over the last couple years because the Sharpie uh, is visible under the layers of painting for a while. And that way I always see the form. To me, um, for me sometimes if I just draw it out in paint, as I start adding layers, the underdrawing starts to, um, starts to move around and then I lose form. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a big fan of the Sharpie. Uh, so here uh, I'm working around the figure and uh, popping in the sky's brights. The sky isn't the brightest bright. It's going to be his uniform. But for now, it's a, it's a bright mid-tone. Let's put it that way. Wherever I know there's going to be darks on Joe DiMaggio's body, I will increase the brightness of the bright alongside it for contrast. So if he's gonna have a black uh, or a dark Yankee blue sleeve, then I'm gonna, I should increase the brightness around. If his glove is gonna be a dark glove, then I'm gonna have brighter sky around the thumb of that leather glove. Okay. You'll have to pardon some of the sloppy camera angles. I've just been uh, using an iPhone connected to like a microphone boon stand with some rubber bands. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, sometimes my arm's in the way, sometimes the camera shakes. Okay, here you see that I, I've instated, I've uh, stated my darkest darks. I've established my darks. As soon as that happens, boom, the painting has contrast. Now just wait until I pop in the brightest brights, then this painting's gonna start to pop. So those are the exciting moments for me is putting in the darkest darks and the brightest brights. Doesn't matter which one you do first, not in my uh, experience. Uh, yep, putting in the dark hat. I think that was uh, back then they had just a dark blue 
hat and a dark blue sleeves. Um, you know, Joe DiMaggio played before my time. But um, in this photo, his sleeves and hat look like an almost black, but I definitely have some navy blue mixed into there. And I'm going to try and put some colorful blacks in there. I don't want it to be just like a black and white photo. So I think you can see some some sap green mixing into his left arm sleeve. Um, there's going to be ultra marine blue. That's like a navy blue. When I cover large areas, I'll dip the brush into some linseed oil to kind of slicken up the paint and stretch that paint. I can also use some paint thinner to stretch paint too if I want to paint thinly. But on, on these large areas here, and I know I'm not going to be layering much, so I, I'm just going to go with fat paint, you know, um, with some uh, linseed oil mixed in. This summer of 2023, I did a series of baseball paintings where I would do a, a big portrait of the the athlete and then a small, I think it's called a vignette, a small little uh, drawing off the corner showing, you know, <clears throat> showing that the guy plays a position and he hits. Or if he's a pitcher, he's pitching and he's posing for the camera. So I, I'd like to, I, I like doing two pictures in one. I think it um, it's more dynamic than just a portrait. It's a little more work, but that's okay. It was summertime. I'm an art teacher on summer break, so I had time on my hands. I felt like this was something productive to do. Okay, I'm putting in some darks in his skin tones, but these are fleshy skin tones now. I know it's hard to see. I dipped into some burnt umber and some alizarin crimson. Those are both transparent, fleshy tone colors that are still, like I said, transparent. They're thin. They're non-committal paint. You know, they're not the opaque stuff. Soon I'll put the opaques in. That means I'll, I'll, I'll basically I'll start uh, grabbing some cadmium red and I'll start grabbing some white and blending it into his skin tones. Maybe some sky blue, some cerulean blue. But right now, it's the darker, transparent, warm colors in his skin. I want Joe DiMaggio's face to appear three-dimensional. And so, that means there's got to be darks, mids, and lights. Oh, here come some lights. Really, the undertone color of the painting, that burnt umber, burnt sienna, thin wash of paint, is temporarily establishing the midtones. So you saw me put in the dark tones of his flesh colors, and now I'm popping in the brights. Now we've got harmony of three, three tones represented. And, and that's how I get a three dimension happening. Ooh, off camera, I did a little extra work there. Okay. Now I put in the mid-tones, sort of a rosy, pinkish hue. You know? Joe DiMaggio has a pinkish hue. Another Seinfeld reference. Uh, work Now, whatever I do to his face, it makes sense to do the same to his, his hand. Looks like I'm just working the mid-tones here. I don't have video footage of everything. This is going to be a shorter video than my uh, Roberto Clemente video. That one's got more painting footage. Okay, now the exciting time. I'm popping in the brights. It's not pure white out of the tube. You could see from my canvas, my palette there, you could see if you, free, if you pause it. You know, there's colors in the white. It's really like a gray, a colorful gray, but it's a bright, relatively. You might be thinking, oh no, you're covering over the Yankee stripes. You're gonna have to redo them all and they're so nice and curvy and they're like cross contour lines that define the form of the fabric of his jersey. Well, don't worry, this Sharpie is really hard to cover up. You can always kind of see through the oil paint and see the Sharpie. 
which is a plus and a negative. Because sometimes I really want to get rid of the evidence of the Sharpie and it takes three, four layers until <clears throat> I can do that. But when this paint starts to dry over the next day or two, in between painting sessions, it will dry mm, more transparent. It will become less opaque and you will see the Sharpie stripes, those Yankee pinstripes reappear. Oh yeah, it's time to uh, like, share, and subscribe to my channel for more music and art. Yep, I can't decide which I like better, so I do painting videos and I do guitar and music videos. And um, somehow uh, that keeps me happy. Okay. All right, now I'm putting in some of the shadows in the fabric. I could have just grabbed some gray. I could have grabbed black plus white and put some gray in there. That would have been fine. But I'm trying to go for a colored photo. Therefore, the grays should be colorful grays. So while I don't see color as well as some other painters, I know there's color in those grays in that photograph. And sometimes by trial and error, I figure out, is it a green gray? Is it a burgundy gray? Is it a bluish gray? And I will try to avoid using black in my colorful grays, which means I'm gonna use two opposite colors or two opposite temperatures. I could use like an orange plus a blue and I'll get like a brownish gray, add some white, and you've got a colorful gray. In this painting, I was probably using um, greens, blues, and alizarin crimsons plus white to get those grays. And to me, that makes the painting exciting and electric. Where did I learn that technique? Ah, uh, Walt Bartman. You're gonna hear me quoting him a lot. Walt Bartman is a teacher at Yellow Barn at Glen Echo, the Yellow Barn studio, where people can take night classes, drawing, painting, um, abstract painting, painting from photographs, painting from models, painting from real life, painting flowers. Um, you check them out online. Boy, do they have an art program there. And um, I've taken many great teachers there, Gavin Glackis, and um, let's see, who else did I take? Did I take Maud? I think I signed up for a class, but then I didn't show up. But I did pay for the class. So, you know, support your local art schools like the Yellow Barn at Glen Echo. But boy, Walt Bartman taught me how to see colors that I used to never see before. Here I've switched to a smaller brush so that I can work in between that, the New York logo. Okay, this is about half an hour later off camera. I decided to work a little bit of yellow ochre into his jersey colors. I want you to feel the sun hitting his jersey, even if it's not the brightest day. The sun's out, it's daytime. You gotta put a little bit of lemony yellow ochre into the, the brights. All right, now it's time for the little drawing of Joe DiMaggio. So for little Joe, I had a black and white photo, but you see there, I just changed the color scheme and, add, and create, made it sepia. So I just cranked up sort of the, the sepia colors. I wanted it to, and now I'm grabbing some burnt umber and some black, and of course, mix with white. I'm gonna do that whole area with no colors other than brown, black, and white. Like old fashioned photos. And that, I think, makes for a nice contrast. You got the main portrait in, uh, in, in, uh, in modern colors, and then you've got the little vignette 
in uh, or detail in um, in uh, you know almost monochromatic, like boring brown. And then I think they complement each other. All right, I want little Joe to stand out, so I've got to uh, really darken around him to make him pop forward by contrast. But I don't want to lose the dark in the right arm of the throwing Joe DiMaggio. So you see how I had to tr change the value, the shade, to a brighter gray right up against his forearm. But then it, 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 it transitions to dark right behind the little Joe at bat. Now I'm bringing in some real black. I got tired of making dark colors, so I, I, I'm bringing in the big guns, bringing in the jet black. Maybe it was called ivory black, but that's okay. I want the uh, little Joe to pop. When the Ken Burns documentary Baseball came out in 1994, I uh, caught some of it on PBS. I was in college, so I couldn't watch all of it. But um, years later, I rented it from the video store, and man, I watched it so many times. And I learned a lot about Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams and Jackie Robinson and the video footage that Ken Burns got of these guys hitting and, and throwing just blew me away because I had never seen that stuff. Um, but uh, I remember I was playing on a men's baseball team at the time, and uh, every game I would try out a different stance based on what I saw in a Ken Burns documentary. So I would try the Joe DiMaggio stance. I'd try Jackie Robinson's. Ted Williams, where he holds the bat way down low by his belt, and he kind of cocks his, his back elbow just before he unleashes a swing. But I learned from that documentary about uh, they covered uh, Joe DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak and how exciting that was for the whole world to watch a man get a hit in 56 consecutive games and it finally ended at 56 and they said in the doc that if he had gotten to 57 then he would have had his picture on the Heinz 57 ketchup bottle and he would have either gotten a, a, a new car as a gift or he would have gotten a big sum of money. There was a big reward he was going to get paid if he had made it to 57. But unfortunately, his streak ended at 56. So he did not get his face on the ketchup bottle. Say it ain't so, Joe. Wait, wrong Joe. Okay, putting some brights on the on the batting Joe there, making him pop in contrast to the dark background. And that's the exciting part for me. So once I have extreme shades happening right up against each other, boom, you have three dimensions. I tell this to my high school students all the time. You wanna make your, uh, your images pop. So I'm trying to merge two pictures together. And here I have to decide, am I going to have darkness or lightness next to the belly of the throwing Joe DiMaggio? And I realize I had to make it a dark gray in order to, to make the, the big image of Joe DiMaggio pop in contrast to the little image. So I had to take some artistic uh, liberties there, deviate from the pictures and meld them together. Uh, tie them together somehow. As an artist, you decide if you want 
big loose brush strokes or if you want things to be wicked smooth, you know, it's up to you. I like to show brush strokes in the foreground and have things smoother and blended in the distance to create more depth. I keep a rag handy. I don't clean the brush to oblivion like Bob Ross. You know, he would he was famous for uh dipping the brush in the uh in the paint thinner and then banging it like crazy against like the leg of a table and he'd say uh I'm beating the hell out of it. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, beat the devil out of that thing. Well, I don't do that. Some artists will really clean their brush in between colors and I don't have that patience, so I just have a rag, I wipe it, and then I go ahead and you know, dip into another color. Yes, I slightly taint the paint um, on my palette by doing that. But I like to work fast. Some people work real slow and steady and really go for perfection. Um, I, I, I get caught up in that sometimes. But when I'm at my best, I aim for good enough. Okay, there's a moment of tension there, or contrast. The sleeve of his arm is dark, but his left shoulder has to be bright if we're gonna see it. So I'm gonna exaggerate that moment of tension, that moment of contrast. I know my hand's in the way, it's hard to see. I think that space above the right throwing arm that's currently a, a, a bright gray right now, I'm gonna eventually change that to a dark shadow or, or maybe a mid-tone. All right, I'm dragging some bright white paint right on that barrel of that bat to make it stand out. In order to do that, you have to just take a leap of faith. You can't fuss with the brush. Whenever you have to execute a deliberate line in painting, you just have to go for it. If I had fussed too much, that bat would have been real crooked. It's not perfect, but it's acceptable what, 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 I, what I've got right there. And the way you, you get good at executing deliberate line strokes with your brush is in the drawing in drawing courses where you take continuous line drawing exercises um, I have my students first first week of school every year draw their shoe without picking the pencil off the paper and by drawing your shoe with a continuous line uh, it forces you to just execute your drawing as for better or for worse without lifting the pencil off the paper and fussing. Usually the drawings come out terrible. Then we crumble them up and then we do a drawing of the crumbled up paper with a continuous line brush. And that drawing looks terrible too, but it's an exercise in uh, executing pencil strokes, or in this case, painting. Okay, in this area here, I'm popping in the brights of the face. Okay, I'm putting opaque, bright skin tones on top of mid-tone skin tones. So now I'm painting wet on wet, layer upon layer. 
So I can drop a color in, but if I drag it too much, it will blend with the under layer. And then I'll lose my, my tone, my shade. I've already established the darks on the face. So now I'm establishing the extreme, the brights. And by doing that, I'm getting three dimension. As I look at the reference photo, I, I'm constantly asking myself, what is the light doing? Where is the light hitting the hardest? Where is it turning to shadow? Whatever the light is doing to his ear, it's doing the same thing to his nose, it's doing the same thing to his neck, to the ball, to his hand. It's being consistent. The light's falling on the top of his chin, the top of his bottom lip, the top of his upper lip, the top of his nose, the top of his cheeks, the same way. The top of his brow. His eyelids are catching light. The surfaces that are perpendicular to the sun are catching the most amount of light and should be the brightest. All right, at this point, uh, this is gonna be, I got about two more clips left of video footage. Here, I'm trying to establish three dimensions on its face, so I'm putting, I'm reestablishing darks, because that was the, darks were the first thing I put in his face earlier in this video. But then when I put in midtones, I kind of lost the darks. So now I'm reestablishing my darks. And that's sort of a battle that's always going on when, when I'm painting in oil. I lose my brights, I gotta put them back in. I lose my darks, I reestablish them. I get up and get a cup of tea or something, I come back, I see my painting from across the room and realize, oh man, my darks aren't dark enough. I'm popping in shadows on the side of that nose there. I don't think I'm using black at all. I'm probably using alizarin crimson, which is a burgundy, mixed with a, a sap green, which is its opposite. <coughs> and those are nice transparent darks when you blend them together. And I can get all the shadowy areas on a person's face with those two colors and maybe a hint of uh, ultramarine blue. Also a transparent color, really good, mixing it with a alizarin crimson and sap green for darks. For colorful shadows. Ones that are transparent that let you see through. I think of, of what I'm doing here is a lot like sculpting. Um, I'm not a sculptor. I once took a stone carving class at, at the uh, Glen Echo. 
But um, they also call it modeling, which is a, a term I believe from sculpting. You're sticking clay on this thing, and you're 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 building up this area, and then you're shaving away that part, and then you're you're smoothing out this area, and you're adding more clay, and you're sculpting. I feel like I'm sculpting at this point. I'm taking a two-dimensional surface and trying to make it look three-dimensional by using darks, mids, and lights while accounting for the colors I see. Right there, that dark inside the ear just made depth happen. And because I did it on one side, I feel I gotta do it on the other side for symmetry and to be consistent. Try and be consistent in your paintings. If you, whatever the light and the shadows are doing in one area it's, of the painting, it's gonna do it to everything. The sun doesn't discriminate. All right, thanks so much for watching me uh, paint Joe DiMaggio of the New York Yankees, a Hall of Famer, one of the greatest hitters of all time, and one of the one of the best Yankees ever to play the game. You can see that I did some work off camera. I did not capture all of this. Must have run out of memory on my phone or something. But uh, this is the finished product here, and I sold it on eBay. Um, and uh, I missed uh, seeing this one go, but I'm glad that it found a, a happy home. Please check out my eBay store under the name Brian Coin for other baseball and rock star images. I usually paint the, the sides black so you don't even need to frame it, and I hang a wire on the back of it so it's ready to hang on the wall right away. So thanks so much. Please like, share, and subscribe. And Check in for more. Thanks so much, you guys. Take care. Hospital. Having trolled the side.